Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Lab Tools webinar. I'm Daniela Ventro, Technical Editor with the Creative Services Team for The Scientist, and I will be moderating our discussion. Today, our speaker, Dr. Benedict Cross, will introduce CRISPR-based tools that allow researchers to address novel questions surrounding essential gene function, hypomorphic expression, and gene dominance. Dr. Cross will also share screening data sets with you and discuss how to analyze and interpret the data. We like our webinars to be interactive. We encourage you to send us your questions or comments at any point during the webinar, and our speaker will address these during the Q&A session following the presentation. To ask a question, simply click on the Ask a Question tab and type your query into the question box located on the bottom left of your screen. We will try to address as many of these questions as we can during our Q&A session. The webinar platform is user-friendly. You can expand the presentation window by simply clicking on the diametrically opposed arrows in the upper right-hand corner of the presentation window. This will maximize the display within your screen. The webinar will be archived on the Scientist website, and we will send you the link via email within a couple of days. Please note that you will not be able to download the presentation slides. I'd like to thank, take this opportunity to thank our webinar sponsor. Horizon Discovery is a world leader in gene editing and gene modulation technologies. Horizon designs and engineers cells using its translational genomics platform, a highly precise and flexible suite of DNA editing tools, and following the acquisition of Deharmacon, its functional genomics platform comprised of gene knockdown and gene expression tools for various research and clinical applications that advance human health. Horizon's platforms and capabilities enable researchers to alter almost any gene or modulate its function in human or mammalian cell lines. Horizon offers an extensive range of catalog products and related research services to support a greater understanding of the function of genes across all species, including the genetic drivers of human disease and the development of personalized molecular, cell, and gene therapies. These have been adopted by over 10,000 academic, drug discovery, drug manufacturing, and clinical diagnostics customers around the globe, as well as the company's own R&D pipeline. Our sponsor has provided us with some helpful resources related to genome-wide screening using CRISPR-I and CRISPR-A tools, and we have posted these under the Resource List tab, which you should be seeing at the bottom left of the webinar window near the Ask a Question tab. You can access and download these documents at any time during the webinar. And with that, let me introduce our speaker, Dr. Benedict Cross. Dr. Cross joined Horizon in 2013 to expand and develop their functional genomic screening capabilities and to lead a major research alliance focused on synthetic lethal target discovery. Benedict now manages Horizon's functional genomic screening platform, including the CRISPR-Cas9 screening service launched in September of 2015. Prior to working at Horizon, Benedict completed his PhD at the University of Manchester and trained as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Cambridge, where he studied reverse chemical genetic screening in the unfolded protein response. Dr. Cross? Thank you, Daniela. Uh, it's uh, very exciting to be here today. Um, we're looking forward to introducing uh, these new tools to the academic and, and pharma communities and anyone who wants to jump on board and, and find out what kind of technology is capable of doing. Specifically today, we're going to spend as much time as possible talking about uh, two new tools, which is CRISPR-I and CRISPR-A, as Daniela introduced. Uh, but I'll spend a few moments at the, the first part of the presentation just introducing the technology uh, from a more generic perspective and providing a bit of an update on our knockout technology as well. So without uh, further ado, I wanted to introduce what uh, the major topic of today's uh, webinar is going to be, which is functional genomic screening. And this is a, an area of research which is extremely powerful in many different uh, aspects, but it's developed with enormous pace over the last three or four years with the advent of CRISPR and the technologies with, which have really empowered this, uh, this approach in lots of research applications. But in broad terms, what we're looking to do with functional genomic screening is link the mutagenesis of a particular gene uh, to a given phenotype. And of course, this asks the question of what, what one gene does in terms of its uh, uh, cellular physiology and how it can affect different aspects of biology, but it asks it on a very, very large scale, even all the way up to whole genome analysis, where you can address the functionality of every single gene in the human genome and how it affects an individual phenotype. So this is an extremely powerful process um, with which to apply into different areas of research. And on this slide here, we've got a sort of drug discovery timeline, and you can maybe envisage that the application of these tools can actually be throughout this process, and that makes it a somewhat unique uh, technology platform, since you're able to use functional genomic screening at a very early stage in, in your you know, discovery process, even in novel biological discovery and in target identification when you're looking many years down the line at the 
long-term development of a drug, uh, a drug program. But actually also all the way down the line, just prior to clinical analysis, this kind of tool can allow you to address and predict patient responses in an in vitro system, which can be extremely powerful and, and even unbiased in terms of the number of different genes it's able to address simultaneously. And in the middle, you've got many different applications where you can start to interrogate gene function, uh, both in relation to um, just direct cellular physiology and different disease states, and also with regard to mechanism of action of individual drugs or therapeutic agents, which might have either unknown or complicated uh, biologies that drive their functionality. So it's a, it's a very broad uh, specification technology, and I hope to be able to actually demonstrate that to you today with some data, with some examples, um, and with some case studies as well. So the first part of the presentation, I would like to talk uh, mostly about pooled functional genomic screening, and then towards the end, I'll also start to pick up on what we call arrayed functional genomic screening, which is a more traditional plate-based well-by-well analysis, which has some specific application advantages. So pool functional genomic screening is characterized by two major aspects. The first being uh, the very, very high resolution analysis you can get, you can, uh, you can achieve in terms of the, the number of genes you're able to study simultaneously. And of course, this goes all the way to the whole genome, and again, I'll describe that today. And the second major aspect of pool functional genomic screening is the, is the funnel through which you conduct your analysis. And that might be considered the readout, for example, how you're actually measuring phenotype. What are you, what are you studying? What pathway are you examining? And what are you exactly find, trying to find out? And that tends to be through uh, relatively few in, uh, individual readouts, maybe, for example, uh, measuring cells' uh, proliferation rate in this, with respect to their uh, a gene knockout that's being conducted in that individual cell, or maybe studying the response of an individual biomarker or a transcriptional process. And all of these processes are very possible and actually very efficient to conduct with a pooled approach. Um, today, we're going to talk, uh, as I said, about uh, CRISPR knockout technologies, but also to introduce you to our new uh, CRISPR activation and CRISPR uh, interference tools, which are really uh, hopefully going to provide a lot more opportunities and maybe some complementarity as well with the knockout technology, as I've described. Okay, but. For those of you uh, maybe unfamiliar with this kind of approach, and just spend a few moments to introduce what it really looks like and what it is we're going to be talking about. So CRISPR-Cas9 screens have been uh, extremely powerful. We've been working at Horizon on them for you know, maybe two, two, nearly three years uh, as we developed our platform and then really started to apply them both internally and as, uh, as part of um, collaborations with, with, um, with many, many groups across the world. But how they actually function is, is quite simple. So what you would be looking to conduct is a screen in a pooled format where you would maybe start by thinking about the kinds of genes you want to study. How many pathways do you want to study? Do you want to study all of the kinases or do you want to collect a series of custom genes which you, know, you have some special interest in? Or do you want to go all the way up to whole gene and analyze every gene that you can potentially target? And what in each case you're going to be doing is targeting them for either knockout, CRISPR-based activation or CRISPR-based repression of gene transcription, as I'll describe. But in all cases, the sort of the fundamentals of the process are quite similar, which is that you design the list of uh, genes that you want to target. You produce a mixed uh, reagent, which could be uh, produced with a massively parallel array synthesis and various kind of molecular, molecular biology techniques, which can pool the cloning process very efficiently. And ultimately, what you end up is a single reagent, which is a lentiviral uh, particle reagent, which will target an optimized cell line for transduction with a very mixed and uh, uh, heterogeneous collection of different individual guide sequences. And it's the guide sequence which targets the gene for knockout. Um, once you've conducted that transduction process, what you'd end up with is what we would describe as a genetically diverse collection of cells. And this would usually be many tens, potentially hundreds of millions of individual cells in a single assay vessel, and all of which represent a different genetic background. So they've it all been individually knocked out for a different gene, um, but they're completely mixed up together. So then once you conduct your assay, uh, screen assay itself, which could be the application of a drug, the change of a growth condition, uh, whether or not maybe you're differentiating the cells or not differentiating the cells and studying that process, and many, many other different kinds of experimentations I'll, I'll try and illustrate today. In either case, the ultimate readout is conducted using deep sequencing. And the reason for that is so that you can deconvolute the population of mixed cells using a, a quantitative readout. Uh, and that's extremely powerful, it turns out, and it's very, very robust in terms of being able to identify individual phenotypes or individual genotypes which are linked to a phenotype. 
and that will become more clean, clear as I show you some examples. So in this next slide, what we've got here is the first example of a, of a screen design that you might, you might consider conducting, and we've conducted very, very many of these. And this is maybe the simplest way of conducting a CRISPR-Cas9 screen. What you're looking at here is a design which shows you uh, the introduction of the lentiviral, mixed lentiviral particles into an optimized cell line, and then the splitting of that, uh, that collection of cells into three different um, treatment tracks, effectively, where you have the control treatment, which is not treated, obviously, or treated with a vehicle of some sort, and then on either side, you've got either positive or negative selection. So here what we're talking about is um, the different ways at which an individual response can be manifested and what would actually happen in that mixed collection of cells that we'd then be identifying with the deep sequencing technology. So on the left-hand side, you've got a positive selection screen. And here what you're looking at is, let's say, for example, you've dropped on a drug onto these cells in your treatment condition, and maybe it's a cytosoptic drug for simplicity. So you'd be expecting the majority of those cells to die as a consequence of the treatment with that drug. Well, what happens with the genetically diverse collection of cells is some of those, as a result of the changes you've introduced with CRISPR-Cas9, will be uh, resistant to that treatment in some way. Maybe they've amplified a pathway which shows uh, a mechanism to overcome that cytotoxicity, or maybe you've just accelerated their growth rate, which allows them to compensate for a, to a certain extent. But either, in any case, those individual clones will selectively accumulate in the population with a greater abundance than their, their sisters and partners, which are genetically modified uh, to change in a way that doesn't affect the response of the drug. And so they will be able to be detected as a greater frequent, frequency population within that overall group of cells. And that would be uh, what we would term positive selection. It can be extremely valuable to understand how a drug might be functioning in terms of its mechanism of action, but it can also be incredible uh, in terms of understanding what resistance mechanisms are even possible. In an unbiased, an unbiased screen, you can predict how maybe a patient population might respond to that treatment in advance of going anywhere near the clinic, which can be extremely valuable and it turns out very, very powerful. And then on the right-hand side, you've got the opposite kind of experiment, but it's conceptually very similar. But here, instead, what you're looking for is you've done the same experiment. You've dropped on a drug that is maybe cytotoxic in some way. And instead, you're looking at things which are selectively lost from the population of this collection of cells. And they would be genotypes that would indicate there is a, an enhanced sensitivity to that drug treatment. Um, and so you may be able to learn, again, something about the way that, that drug is functioning in terms of its mechanism of action within the cells. You might also start to understand maybe some potential combination treatments. Maybe you can target these genes with another drug and find an enhancement of your, uh, of your compound and mechanism of action. Uh, or many, many other potential kinds of activity could be drawn from this simple paradigm. The two arms that are depicted on this slide are, as I said, conceptually similar, but they're very different in terms of their data quality and the properties. So, for example, negative selection screening is extremely challenging to do. Um, mostly on account of the technical sensitivity that is required to detect things which have very low abundance in that sample. So just by, by the very nature of them being rare events because they've been lost from the population, it challenges the deep sequencing technology that little bit more and you need to think uh, carefully about how to design those experiments to get the most power out of them. And at Horizon we've developed lots of different tools to be able to do that and had some really fantastic success stories which I'll try and talk about a bit today. But what if you're not interested in proliferation uh, as a simple readout for how cells are behaving? Many, many different aspects of biology are going to be totally unconcerned with the way cells develop in terms of their proliferation rate, but might well be concerned about how an individual cell might respond to uh, in, 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 by way of a, a transcriptional process or a particular protein abundance or stability, um, or even indeed some protein, protein interaction which might mark a particular phenotype. And if those are the key aspects of the cellular physiology that you're interested in, then these kind of CRISPR-Cas9 screens are nevertheless extremely powerful ways to interrogate cell function. And described on this slide is one example of how to conduct that kind of experiment. Here, what you'd be looking to do instead is to generate the same genetically diverse uh, mixture of cells through this CRISPR-Cas9 lentiviral-based approach. But instead, now what you'd be doing is looking to stain those cells, maybe with a with an antibody, or maybe use a reporter cell line which houses a fluorescence reporter which marks a particular transcription event. Maybe that in turn closely is, is closely associated with, the, associated with the disease state of the cell. And ultimately, what you can then do is use a large-scale high-throughput flow cytometry in, to enable you to physically separate cells in accordance with their response at that biomarker level. So let's say 
uh, you have a very, very, a very, very low uh, uh, expression level of this particular biomarker at a steady state, and you're looking for things which increase that expression level. Well, you can collect those by flow cytometry and then respectively deep sequence those populations independently to understand which genotypes generated by the CRISPR-Cas9 are able to promote that state in the cells. And that can be a really, really exciting way of examining um, different aspects of cell biology. You can also make it a bit more complex by looking at intracellular proteins, uh, staining them uh, in, in a post-fixed state or pre-fixed state uh, prior to the uh, flow cytometry. And you can even extend this analysis to look at things which would ordinarily be secreted from the cells. And here you can look at things like intracellular cytokine staining to block the secreted product in the cells using something like profeldin A, and then subsequently stain it using your, uh, your, your uh, immunohistochemical approach. And the reason why that's key, that fixation uh, that is, that is um, preceded by this, uh, this Golgi blocking approach, is that in order to collect co uh, sufficient data from this kind of approach, you need to physically couple the uh, biomarker response to the cell from which it emerges. Because the way the deep sequencing technology works, it's going to, it's going to be analyzing the cell from which it came from. The, the, the nuclear material uh, is going to be sequenced directly. And unless the biomarker response is directly coupled to that uh, cell from which it emanates, you won't be able to successfully deconvolute the screen data um, with, uh, with suitable rigor. So collectively, all these kind of approaches, which are just some examples of how this technology can be applied, can open up lots of different opportunities for different experimental designs. And uh, we'll show some examples of those today. So before we get into uh, the CRISPR-A and CRISPR-I technologies that we're very excited about uh, discussing today, um, I wanted to provide a bit of an update since uh, I last presented a webinar last year and, and, and how our technology has progressed, um, mostly thinking about the knockout, but also some fundamental principles of how we think this technology can be best applied. Um, so in the previous webinar, we talked a little bit about um, some technology that we improved slightly by adapting the tracer sequence of CRISPR-Cas9 um, infrastructure. And that work has now been published, and this slide just start, highlights some of the major findings from that study, which overall provided a, an increase in sensitivity of this kind of technology by you know, an estimate of maybe tenfold, but it varied by different, uh, different genes, and overall had a, a really big impact on the kinds of things that you could actually do with this, this, uh, this kind of technology. So I won't spend too much time talking about that today. Um, but I would like to spend a little bit of time thinking about library design. And here, this is an aspect that we spend a lot of time meditating on at Horizon because we're really interested to make sure you can get the best guide selection for the most powerful kind of screen. And those of you who will be familiar with um, you know, how these kind of designs are conducted and the field of CRISPR-Cas9 has developed so rapidly, and there are gains and new understandings to be made all the time about how this, uh, these enzymes function and how uh, to get the most from them. We're always trying to keep up to date with those technologies and developments, and this is an example of where we've tried to test uh, new guide design algorithms against existing guide design algorithms. So, for example, shown in orange on this slide, and, and all, all of these individual data uh, uh, graphs basically depict pretty much the same thing, illustrated slightly differently in each case. In orange is shown some of the newer guide design systems developed by John Dench's group at the Broad Institute, where he's been looking to specifically try to maximize the quality of the guides that he's selecting through his algorithms and systems which uh, can uh, determine the best guide sequences. And in particular, to try and eliminate off-target or in, um, inactive guides from the collection that you'd ultimately go through and use in your pool genetic screen. And then in the other colors, you've got some guides which were selected by uh, previous uh, iterations of the algorithm, including in blue, um, some data published in 2014 from Eric Lander and David Sabatini's group, where they'd also use a machine learning approach to eliminate and, and optimize guide design selection process. And in the, in the green is guides that were selected by both algorithms. And actually, the major message here is that whilst we absolutely uh, see the benefit of using improved and iteratively uh, advanced guide design systems in uh, gene editing technologies in general, when they're used in, in, in concert with our improved tracer system, which is shown in this slide, you find that actually the differences are relatively modest, and actually these, all of these guide design systems perform relatively similarly. The uh, Dench et al. data set shows um, a slightly improved ability to eliminate inactive guides, but overall not massively different to previous systems. Uh, and in cons consequence, what we are looking to try and do here is 
to make greater steps in the ability of CRISPR-Cas9 to conduct gene editing, maybe, for example, through protein engineering and bigger leaps, in, including the ones we're going to present today in CRISPR-I and CRISPR-A. Um, we've also spent a lot of time over the last uh, 18 months thinking about how to do drug gene interaction studies. And this is one of some of the some of the kind of experimental paradigms that I explained on the first few slides. And one of the things we've learned a lot about is how to optimize dosing systems in order to maximize the discovery rate from your screens. And really this is about thinking how to, how to, how to tweak the system either in the case of the resistance screen when you're looking for things which are selectively enriching as a consequence of the gene knockout versus the sensitivity side when you're looking for things which are selectively uh, dropped out of the population. And those two experiments, as I sort of hinted at previously, should probably be designed differently. So for example, a resistance screen, you'd want to apply a very high selective pressure on the treated population cells so that any emerging resistance factors have a very, very large window of growth in which to develop in comparison to the control population. Whereas the opposite is true in a sensitivity screen, where you want to dose the, drug, the cells with a sufficient quantity of, uh, of therapeutic or drug agent uh, to provide a clear evidence that there is a, a phenotypic effect being enacted by that treatment, but without overdosing so that you end up with a very limited window in, in which sensitivity can possibly emerge because you've pretty much maxed out the effect already. So I'll describe some more explicit data around that with some, some real data rather than theoretical data in a few slides of time. So one of the other things we've been working on a lot is this facts-based approach, the biomarker screening, which I introduced on a few slides back. And I'm going to just spend a few moments now introducing and describing a pilot study which we conducted uh, in collaboration um, with uh, one of our partners. And this is to evaluate how well uh, the binding properties of uh, CD80 with, uh, to its partner, CD28, could be detected by a CRISPR-Cas9 fax link screen. So the paradigm here is to use the, uh, the natural interaction between these two uh, components. And of course, there's, there's a lot of interest in these components through the immunology uh, for the research sector. And what we wanted to try and explore was uh, the question of, can we detect CD28 knockout cells via their inability to bind a CD80 uh, recombinant fragment, which was fluorescently stained? So the screen design is shown briefly on this slide where we would take a, a guide library targeting a collection of, in this case, kind of random control genes. Um, into that collection, we would then spike in known concentrations or known cell numbers of um, isogenic CD28 cells. And then we would uh, conduct the screen, allow them to develop, the screen to develop, and then use flow cytometry to then separate those populations based on their, the cell's ability to bind this fluorescent CD80. So a cell which cannot bind CD80 would be predicted to be the CD28 knockout uh, cell line. And that's exactly what we then explored using flow cytometry and, and deep sequencing. The data are very briefly described on this slide, where what we're looking at is on the bottom left-hand side, the fold enrichment of the CD28 in the negatively stained bracket. So you can see very clearly that it enriched very dramatically in the unstained collection of cells. Um, so that was, would, might be considered a, a reasonable success. But of course, in that context, we pretty well know what we're looking for. We were just looking at CD28. We knew what the guys were coding, and it was very easy to pick that data out and see how well they were enriched. But what would it look like in the context of a completely random collection of cells? And that's shown on the right-hand side, which is the sort of real pseudo-screen uh, data, effectively. So here, each individual dot represents a different gene. The x-axis re represents a fold enrichment factor uh, in a log two score. And the, the y-axis indicates the p-value or the significance of the effect, which is assimilated from multiple individual guides targeting each gene. And what you can see there is the CD28 in the top right-hand corner showing a very, very high significance and a very reasonable fold enrichment, um, separated most importantly from the whole rest of the data set, indicating that it was the only significant hit in this particular screen and providing a reasonable proof of concept that you can uh, effectively knock out CD28 and then pull it back out of a mixed population of cells, deep sequence it, and identify it as a hit. So it's a very nice proof of concept. There are many flaws to this particular experiment. And in the process, we learn an enormous amount uh, about how these kinds of screens can be conducted and what are the important considerations, uh, but enlightening and interesting from our perspective. 
Okay, so now uh, to the main um, bits of information that I'd like to try and get across today. Uh, we have a, a very exciting technology development at Horizon, which is um, now we've developed and, and, and validated two new tools, CRISPR uh, A and CRISPR I, and we'd like to introduce them to you today. So these will be two completely new uh, technology platforms which will go alongside our CRISPR knockout technology. Um, all of them are pooled approaches in this first iteration, but I'll describe some arrayed approaches on some later slides. So they are amenable to very, very high level of uh, data analysis in terms of the number of genes that you can study. So you can go all the way up to the whole genome, and I'll show that example. Um, and they have very different um, application potentials. So for example, CRISPR-A is really an, a very, very novel tool since the, it's really the only powerful way to conduct functional genomics looking for gain of function uh, effects. So this will selectively and site-specifically amplify expression from individual loci um, and then, then you'll be able to evaluate what happens when you overexpress those genes in a very, very highly uh, um, resolved data set. CRISPR-I, very like CRISPR knockout, is a, is a loss of function technology, but is, is um, certainly different in the kinds of the quality of the data that you get back or the sort of properties of the data that you get back and provides some really exciting new opportunities as I'll try and describe with some data. So why are we so excited about developing these tools? Um, we've had an enormous amount of success with the CRISPR knockout technology. We've been able to produce some wonderful data sets, uh, identify targets from unknown drugs, uh, find some incredibly interesting new genetic inter interactions, and really start to explore mechanism of action and, uh, um, uh, and drug synthesization as well. But there are some aspects of biology which render themselves, just by their nature, quite inaccessible to CRISPR knockout. And this started becoming apparent around the turn of the year when some data that we were developing and then also some, some, some very nice papers that came out around December 2016 supporting those observations around what happens when you uh, produce uh, or design guides sort of inadvertently, maybe accidentally, which have a high propensity for off-target cutting. Um, these are what we would term, internally at least, as super guides. And they are often found to be a very, very um, substantially dropped out from the population overall, which would indicate so when you're looking at a time result analysis, that is, which would indicate that they were very highly toxic to the cells. And what, we, what it turned out is if you overlaid those high, those super guides with the off-target propensity, what you found is that there was a very nice alignment. And if you had a prediction of uh, a, a greater than maybe, say, as a rule of thumb, 10 individual cutting sites uh, from an individual guide as a, on account of um, its off-target binding, what was occurring was uh, the, uh, the, the initiation of a catastrophic DNA damage response from those multiple simultaneous uh, double-strand breaks induced by Cas9, and the cells would consequently die and perish overall in the screen, irrespective of the locus at which you were intending to target. So that's a pretty rare event, to be absolutely honest, overall in the knockout screen, and it can be bioinformatically accounted for, and it can also be eliminated by better design of libraries. But it also highlighted a phenomenon which can't be overcome, which is, for example, the study of amplified loci where multiple cutting sites are going to be, uh, going to be enacted no matter what you do, no matter how well you design your guides. And, uh, and cell lines with a very high degree of aneuploidy, such as gene cancer, might be subject to this kind of phenomena as well. So maybe there were some chinks in the armor, as we described in CRISPR knockout technology, which maybe opened up some gaps for alternative technologies. And the second major um, development that was very exciting to us was the improvement really overall of CRISPR-I and CRISPR-A, um, which was, came about through some um, really interesting studies conducted at UCSF, where groups uh, headed, by, uh, headed up by John Wiseman had uncovered the, uh, the, 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 the sensitivity or the, the efficacy of individual guides uh, in relation to their locus and most specifically around the, I guess, the solvent access or the, the ability of these guides to stay constitutively bound to the, to the, the nucleoside which they were targeted to. And so really this is about accessibility and chromatin binding and, and um, how well you're able to um, target these guides to an individual locus. And it turned out that where you had a very high density of histones protecting and shielding the genomic DNA, you were finding guides which were poor in terms of their overall efficacy. And if you avoided those regions, you could provide a much better uh, performance. This was true both in, to a certain extent in knockout technologies, but most importantly, when it came to things like CRISPR-I and CRISPR-A, which, as I'll describe, require constitutive binding uh, of the, the DCAS9 in this case to these sites 
it had a very, very big impact on the performance of the libraries that they were designing, and um, some, some big gains were made in terms of the overall library design. So that really triggered our interest in a big way, and we, we went ahead and developed um, some systems to try and exploit these CRISPR-I and CRISPR-A technologies uh, for all that they're worth, really. So let me spend a bit of time introducing CRISPR-I initially. Um, so CRISPR interference uses a, a catalytically dead uh, Cas9. So this is a, an enzyme which has been um, inactivated by a site-specific mutation at both of its nucleus active sites and is now no longer able to cut the DNA. And instead, what we, what's being conducted is um, an analysis where you target these, this enzyme to uh, different, different regions in the, in the genome, most specifically uh, regions which flank the transcriptional start site around the promoter regions. And then just alone, without any further additions, that complex is able to sterically block the access of transcriptional activators and polymerases and consequently causes a, a modest repression of gene expression at those low sites. If you then fuse that uh, enzyme, or bindase, I guess, it's not a nuclease anymore, um, to agents which can stabilize the complex on the genomic DNA, such as the crowd component uh, indicated, uh, illustrated in this uh, diagram here, you can provide an even greater level of repression um, at those sites. So this is, as I described it, a loss of function technology in, in, the, in the sense that you're repressing uh, transcriptional uh, activation or, or transcription in, in general from these sites, and it allows the opportunity to study maybe some different areas of biology. So clearly there's an opportunity here to study these amplified loci, which was to a certain extent inaccessible um, to CRISPR knockout technologies. The fact that you're repressing gene expression rather than eliminating it completely would be uh, maybe considered to be a, a slightly better model for drug ability, since there are very few drugs which are going to completely ablate uh, the presence of a protein from the cells, and rather you're likely to cause um, functional inactivation, uh, which might be better modeled by transcriptional repression. So that, that there you can bring in this element of uh, looking at hypermorphic uh, mutations rather than complete loss of function. And this therefore kind of own, uh, lends itself, I guess, to the study of essential genes, which whilst theoretically able to be studied by a complete gene um, elimination technology like CRISPR knockout, screening, really the data, data quality becomes a bit challenging because those, uh, those cells which harbor the knockouts of these essential genes are very rapidly lost from the population, and so looking at any subtle effects can be really quite challenging. So here there's another good application for CRISPR-I. You can also look at non-protein coding regions much better for technical reasons with these, this, these tools. And we also think there's a lot of opportunities uh, to combine these tools. So in particular, looking at the combination of CRISPR-I with CRISPR knockout, and also, as we'll describe today, looking at uh, the combination of CRISPR-I with CRISPR-A, or at least developing parallel data sets which can be analyzed uh, together. So we've developed uh, a number of different tools at Horizon. We've explored uh, the best and the most optimal way to conduct CRISPR-I, looking at the, the, the site, the fusion, whether or not you can do dual, dual crab fusions, whether or not you should use a single vector system or a two vector system, uh, what kind of cell lines are amenable to this kind of technology, and what sort of loci look good. And overall, come up with a system which, uh, but fairly fortuitously, very closely models what we've been doing over the past few years with the CRISPR knockout tool, which is using a one vector system to bring in simultaneously CRISPR, uh, the CRISPR agents in terms of the guide and the tracer sequence, and the Cas9, or in this case, the DCAS9 together, uh, all in one vector system. The reason why that's beneficial is because it allows you to only conduct one transduction event which means there's no gap between the introduction of the Cas9 and the guide, and that can be very important, especially to cell lines which are sensitive to the expression of Cas9 alone. Generally, they won't be sensitive to the expression of Cas9 with a guide, and that seems to sequester the toxic effects to a certain extent. Uh, so it can allow you to uh, work with uh, more vulnerable cell lines, primary lines that don't survive well in culture and you have a limited amount of time, or cell lines which are just in general sensitive to the transduction process and won't tolerate two rounds of a relatively aggressive process. So hugely advantageous from, from the kind of practical sense, but also in terms of the data quality that these, uh, this particular approach allows us, it's, we think, maybe got some, um, got some advantages too, since you are physically coupling the expression of the guide sequences to the expression of the, of the, of the Cas9. And although you can rely quite, quite well on a dual antibiotic system, um, knowing for certain that you're going to have expression of the Cas9 uh, whenever you detect the presence of the guide, uh, does provide some advantages in terms of the limitation of noise in the data set. 
So that's the way we developed the CRISPR eye tool, and I'll show the data for how that looks in a few slides of time. But first of all, what, does, what is CRISPR A and how have we developed uh, what we're using, Horizon? So CRISPR A is, is really exciting, and it turns out there are lots of different ways to conduct uh, activation using CRISPR uh, or sort of adapted Cas9 again using a, a catalytically dead Cas9 here. Um, and many of these techniques are at least um, sort of owe some debt of gratitude to work in zinc fingers and talons that have also been looking at these kind of fusion approaches to control uh, transcription rather than gene editing. Um, you could just use a simple transcriptional activator like the BP16. Uh, you can do them in tandem. You can bring in other activators like P65. Um, or there's some really clever things to do with single chain antibodies, uh, such as the SunTag system, which brings in up to 10 or even more than that, 24 uh, of these BP64 moieties to drive transcriptional activation with very, very high degree of activity. Uh, or there's the VPR system, which again uses a tandem fusion of three different prescriptional activators, which is a really nice uh, approach as well. Uh, Horizon, we sort of pre preferentially in our pool system lent towards what is described as the SAM system, which was developed by Feng Zhang's group uh, back in 2015, which uses a really clever aptima based approach to uh, bring in both Cas9 uh, fused to VP64 and the uh, ability to bring in uh, multiple different uh, uh, tandem fusions through an RNA binding um, cassette, which links the uh, P65 and the HSF1 components that are fused uh, to an MS2 stem loop that is integrated into the tracer domain of the of the RNA component of Cas9. So that's a really neat system to bring in a, a heterogeneous collection of components, which we think drives the the greatest degree of activation of the greatest number of loci, and that's. Um, reasonably well supported by some nice data sets available um, uh, in the public domain. The advantages are that it provides a high degree of activity, but it is uh, quite complex. As you can see, it's, uh, it, it, it requires multiple different components, and so to conduct screens with this uh, takes, a bit of, uh, takes a bit of skill and some time to develop. But it has lots of different potential advantages in terms of the application, similar to CRISPR-I. Clearly, this is the first really uh, potent gain of function analysis. Uh, the only real opportunities previously were around things like cDNA and ESD libraries, which are uh, traditionally quite hard to generate good data sets from, and certainly much more complex and less accessible. Um, again, you can study non protein coding regions, and there's this opportunity to combine the data sets, which we think is really, really exciting as well. So, I'm going to, over the next few slides, share with you our validation um, data. And here we're going to be looking at the, uh, the, 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 the screens we've conducted with both CRISPR-A and CRISPR-I specifically. So guides which are targeting uh, these, uh, well, targeting using these components have their, have their design very slightly differently to the way CRISPR knockout guides would be designed, in, in usually in the early exons uh, of a coding sequence, whereas the CRISPR-I and CRISPR-A components are targeted flanking the transcription of start site. And there's some really nice work, uh, detailed studies being conducted uh, to try and describe the best loci which to target these components to. And we expect this to be a developing field um, that will, again, just as we have done with knockout technology, we'll need to keep abreast of the latest developments and use our own data sets to improve library systems and guide selection as we go along. But right now, they look really potent, and we've developed whole genome libraries against, uh, against uh, the human uh, sequences using both CRISPR-A and CRISPR-I uh, tool systems. So the paradigm that I'm going to show you today is a, is a positive selection screen using the BRAF inhibitor demorafenib. So what we're looking at here, this is a cytotoxic drug which targets B600D BRAF, and which is present in A375 melanoma line. And this is a really important um, paradigm in oncology because um, this is a very, very valuable inhibitor, or targeting BRAF is a very um, powerful way to eliminate, um, eliminate tumor cells from, from, from patients. But the generation of um, resistance mechanisms is really, really dramatic. And in fact, you can see even in clinical um, data sets, the emergence of, of resistance, which can be really rapid and, and catastrophic ultimately to the use of this, this particular inhibitor. But importantly, uh, for this study, there are also some existing data sets that we could benchmark our, our tools against. And there are known both uh, from previous functional genomic screens and also through, from uh, smaller and um, sort of genome-wide association study-based data, 
uh, existing both gain and loss of function mutations which uh, present uh, resistance to bemiraphanib. So that, that allows us the opportunity to use both loss of function and gain of function tools to explore this particular phenomena in cells and uh, find out how these tools are really behaving. So the screen uh, sort of cell line development or uh, cell culture development is depicted on this slide here where what we're looking to try and uh, describe or, or find out is how well the population was suppressed overall over the duration of the screen. So what happens in these screens is you create a huge uh, collection of transduced cells, you grow them out for a certain amount of time in the presence of the drug, and each of those, uh, throughout that time, maybe two to three weeks, maybe four weeks, depending on the, the speed of the cell's growth rate, you will be measuring and counting and finding out how well the uh, treated population was suppressed in terms of its growth rate compared to the controlled population. So we're not growing billions of cells here, but we're projecting the amount of cells that would have been collected had we never passed out to the cells. And we're plotting it on this graph where you can see a very nice uh, log growth of the control treated cells and the uh, suppressed population of the treated uh, cells with bemiraphanib. And that's uh, an optimal selective pressure, it's maybe a little bit higher than we sometimes go. But the point of that is that it would allow the emergence of resistance, just as I was describing at the beginning of the presentation, to develop uh, from that suppressed population so that it was uh, readily detectable by the deep sequencing technology. And to spend a brief moment on what that technology looks like. So in each of the samples that we're analyzing in these kinds of studies, what we're really actually doing is collecting the genomic material or the plasma material if we're looking at the, the plasma itself, uh, extracting the DNA and targeting our deep sequencing to the guide expression cassette itself. And actually we sequence the guide itself and that uh, provides a barcode for the genotype of the cells from which it was found. So what we're saying is if we can detect the presence of the guide, we make the assumption that that guide was also then functioning and was knocking out the gene to which that guide was targeted. And we can map all that back. And that turns out to be a very robust assumption. Um, and also, most importantly, it's highly, highly quantitative. So you can determine frequency of these gene types in any given uh, sample population. And that's how we do our, our hit discovery. So how did the screen data look in the CRISPR eye? So there are many ways to look at quality control. And uh, we, I'm not going to spend too much time on this today in terms of from the technical side. But one of the ways we like to look at quality control, which is sort of the most intuitive, is to evaluate how collections of control genes behaved in that data set. And one of the easiest things to analyze is um, the, the level of dropout of an essential guide. So the, 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 uh, the, the, the concept here is that a gene which is, target, which is known to be essential, let's say a ribosomal gene, cells can't survive without, if you target them for knockout, or in this case, uh, transcriptional repression, those cells should ultimately suffer in terms of their proliferation rate, proliferation rate and ultimately die. Uh, they will be lost from the population, you should be able to measure that. And that's exactly what's plotted on this first graph here, where we've grouped a number of different controls which we've developed over time into either positive, negative, or non-targeting uh, guides. So the non-targeting guides don't bind anywhere in the genome. The negative controls are expected to provide no proliferation disadvantage when they're suppressed. And the positive control guides are expected to be lost from the population. And that's exactly what's plotted. Uh, this is a longitudinal study, so we're looking at loss over time in log two on the axis. And what you can see is a very nice dropout over all of that group of individual genes and guides. If you look at the gene level data, so this is now instead of looking at the whole group together, splitting it out by the individual genes and, and plotting the median of the individual guides that target them, you can see that they indeed all do drop out. And of course, now the log two dropout rates are slightly greater in some of those instances. But you can also start to see that there's a bit of variance in terms of the neutral controls. And that's exactly what we'd expect because we understand that there is a cell-specific response when you're knocking out all of these genes. And the, uh, the, the, the ability to have a universally neutral guide has not yet been detected, at least in our data set. So some, uh, some guides will have a greater effect than others. Uh, if you look at the individual guides, uh, you can see that there's going to be um, some guys who drop out quite extensively. Uh, and if you plot them as terms of a waterfall, you can see that they are indeed uh, distributed as, as you'd expect uh, as the greatest uh, dropout overall in the population. So what does the screen data set look like? It looked like um, this. So this is a, a, what we described as a typical screen data set plot where you're plotting the enrichment factor on the x-axis and the p-value, or, or in this case, the RRA score on the y-axis. 
and you can see a number of interesting hits pop up already looking quite exciting. These are now shown on this slide and they are, they are really in line exactly with our expectations in terms of the, the genes which appear um, in, in previous studies and also which are known to generate resistance to bemiraphanib uh, once they're either knocked out or in this case repressed by CRISPR-I. So that's a really nice response. Many of these form uh, part of the mediator complex, which is a known repressor of uh, downstream repressor of the NECO pathway. So repressing it is a way to activate that process and generate cell proliferation, even in the presence of bemiraphanib. The guide data is plotted on this uh, slide, where you can start to see that the abundance or overall enrichment of many of these components was extremely high. So in the case of MED12, the top bit, all of the individual guides were enriched by around 16,000 fold in the data set. So that's an enormous level of sensitivity in terms of the effect rate and makes it very, very easy to detect and is clearly very, uh, indicating a very efficacious data set. In terms of the other hits we found, uh, there are many novel hits in this data set that haven't been previously detected by CRISPR knockout. And many of these were actually, as we hoped, uh, found to be essential genes. So these were uh, genes which were uh, probably difficult to detect using a knockout technology on account of the fact that their abundance in the, in the overall screen population would have been quite low. And to compare it directly to a knockout technology, we have an in-house data set already developed using our, our, our platform in its immature state, which is depicted on the left-hand side. And you can see overall, whilst you have this, if you take, for example, MED12 for the top bit, a very, very high enrichment and abundance in the CRISPR-I screen, it's clearly also the top in the knockout screen, but the sensitivity is quite a lot lower. We would expect that if we repeated this screen today with our adaptive tracer system, which we uh, described previously, uh, it would perform much, much better. But nevertheless, it indicates that CRISPR-I is providing a very, very high level of sensitivity. And actually, if you take into account the, the way the screen is designed, the detection of MED12 is almost the maximum possible level of detection, uh, theoretically, from the way the screen is designed. So we really are missing very little of the effect change uh, using this approach. So what about CRISPR-A? So CRISPR-A can also be used in the same paradigm. And we're looking here uh, at inhibitors which activate, uh, sorry, rather, components which when overactivated also provide resistance. And so this is receptor tyrosine kinases like things like EGFR, which can promote this uh, uh, cell proliferation even in the presence of this inhibitor. And again, we had to try and define a control population. So unlike the CRISPR-I, this is not as easy to detect. But what we did find is a number of genes which when dropped out um, were aligned to their function and found to be uh, things like cell cycle inhibitors, which again is exactly the kind of gene you'd expect to provide a, a loss of viability overall in the, uh, in the cells which are um, just not treated with the amorapinib, but just analyzed in a longitudinal sense. So this is now the definition of a sort of control population which we'll be looking to develop over the next screen that we, we produce. So the screen data for the CRISPR-A is also a highly robust data set. Again, we found uh, all of the hits that have been identified by previous studies. Uh, and again, we found the top hit to be enriched by a really, really significant um, degree. If we compare it directly to previous studies, for example, the one conducted by Frank Zhang's group a few years back, you can again now see that the same hits were identified and, and indeed many novel hits within the same pathways. Um, and now we're seeing the increase in sensitivity. So for example, taking the top here, GFR, showing this enormous degree of um, enrichment overall in this new platform. Again, almost the maximum possible degree of uh, enrichment in this data set. So as I, as I mentioned, there were many, many genes identified that were expected. The green ones shown on this table were the ones that were expected and identified in previous uh, studies or data sets. And the novel genes, which were also found, which we were quite excited about following up as well. So what happens when you pull these data sets, so to speak, and start to try and understand how they, can, how they cross relate, how they compare? So one of the really interesting phenomena was to observe what we describe as switch-like effects where you find that, for example, the inhibition or the interference of expression of a particular gene might promote a resistance phenotype in response to the drug. Maybe what you'd expect to see is if you activate that gene, you see the exact opposite effect, for example, sensitization to the drug. And on the other hand, if you look at, for example, um, genes which, when, um, when activated by CRISPR-A, provoke uh, resistance to the treatment, maybe the opposite effect might also be manifested by the inhibition of the, that same component using CRISPR-I. 
So we looked at our data set to see whether or not we could observe that. We wouldn't expect to see it everywhere because uh, the biology is likely to be a lot more complex than that. But we were nevertheless able to identify some really nice case studies where indeed that effect was observed. So a good example is in uh, the integrin B5 component and in EGFR, which the data is slightly dwarfed by the very, very robust enrichment of the CRISPR, um, CRISPR-A data set. But you could, we were nevertheless able to identify a, res, a sensitization of the cells on inhibition of uh, expression of EGFR uh, using our CRISPR-I technology, even though really the experiment wasn't designed or optimized to discover that. That really showed a very robust level of detection and sensitivity of the, of the screening data set and started to show uh, some nice ideas about how these data sets can be pooled to understand gene networks and maybe even to do novel hit identification based on the combination of these two different data sets. So another good example of that was when we started to look a bit more in depth about uh, uh, the way cells were ultimately turning over in this population through apoptosis and looking specifically at the component MCL1, which again, uh, we were able to detect very, very substantial sensitivities of the cells on following repression of MCL1 with CRISPR-I uh, uh, after uh, bemirafenib treatment. So what happens when you uh, conduct the, uh, the experiment on its interacting partners in terms of the, uh, the biological function of MCL1? The two good examples of this are NOXA and BIM, which interact functionally with, uh, with MCL1, either by inhibiting it or by being inhibited and provoking, provoking apoptosis. And again, now here you can see some really nice patterns where, for example, if you activate, hyperactivate uh, NOXA with CRISPR-A, you you would consequently block MCL1 function, which thereby blocks the anti-apoptotic function of that component, and they would drive their sensitivity. And similarly for BIM, you can see exactly the same phenotype developing there. So now you can start to understand how, by combining these kinds of technologies, you can see uh, maybe more than the sum of the parts and start to join up the dots in gene networks and maybe even identify, if you expand this uh, paradigm, some novel hits, which maybe didn't score fantastically highly in terms of the overall data set, but which might sit right in the middle of a particularly important gene network and may well even be uh, easier to intervene with in terms of therapeutic applications or tell you exactly what you really feel like you need to know in terms of the, the biology that you're studying. So we think there's a lot of really exciting opportunities for pooling these data sets, uh, including by amplifying the quality of the data using two lots of function technologies like CRISPR and CRISPR knockout or also by looking at pairwise analysis of CRISPR-A and CRISPR-I to start to understand opposing effects and how they interact um, with the study that you're looking to conduct. So lots of very, very exciting opportunities. All right, I've only got a few minutes left, but I'd like to spend a, a few uh, moments thinking about array screening because as powerful as pooled functional genomic screening is, there is uh, still a very important and clear niche uh, for array functional genomic screening uh, which is inaccessible for pooled approaches. And this is usually on account of the complexity of the readout uh, or the, um, the depth of, or resolution of the data which is required from the assay endpoint. So when you need, for example, a high content data set, certain enzymatic function analysis or even protein-based analysis that is, for one reason or another, inaccessible to pooled approaches, then an, an array screen is, is really where you need to be going. And there are, there are lots of different ways to conduct array screening, of course, sRNA is still an extremely valuable technology because of its speed and accessibility and relatively cheap cost point in terms of the conducting screens. So it can be a very, very nice way to interrogate gene function uh, in, a, in a very quick, streamlined fashion. But gene editing tools, CRISPR-I and CRISPR-A tools are all now coming to bear on functional genomics. And in particular, uh, we're able to develop a number of different uh, proof of concept studies uh, with our partners at Darmacom. Um, who have already been involved in the development and, and de uh, demonstration of a, either knockout technologies using synthetic CRISPR RNA libraries, um, where you can use, importantly, high content-based analyses to read out on gene function uh, and show a very, very highly reproducible effect um, using all sorts of different approaches effectively. And also, we're excited uh, to, to just highlight today that in a few months' time, We'll also be launching uh, a synthetic uh, CRISPR-A reagent data set or well, data resource, uh, which includes uh, both uh, synthetic CRISPR RNAs, lentiviral sgRNAs, and also the, the tools to allow you to, to bring in the, the DCAS9 um, components as well. So in the case of the array setup, 
what we're highlighting is the use of the VPR system, which is the most amenable to a rate screening to, to develop, for example, a cell line. You only need to bring in really kind of one component prior to bringing in your synthetic CRISPR uh, reagent, and then you can develop some very nice rapid uh, activation of uh, site specific activation of, uh, of loci using the libraries that we're going to be able to uh, share with you. Uh, these tools would be compatible with the SunTag system as well, but they wouldn't be compatible with the, the, the SAM system on account of the complexity of that uh, particular system and the difference in the tracer and the way that functions. So still a lot of different opportunities from these particular tools, and we're really excited about that in the coming months. Uh, so finally, before I skip over a few other slides, we are also working very heavily on the uh, development of inducible systems, because there are many instances where you require kinetic control of your genetic modulation or your perturbation so that you can start to tease out more subtle temporal effects from the, the biology that you're looking at. Um, we are already able to provide some reagents which share, um, which would provide you the tools to do some of these activities, especially with knockout technologies, and we're going to be developing those in terms of transcription control as well over the coming months. One good example is the use of um, unstable degrad motifs fused to Cas9, which can allow you a sort of constitutive degradation of the Cas9, and then you can stabilize that with small molecules. That's quite a nice approach as well as alternative or traditional doc-based systems. All right, I think uh, I can summarize now by uh, highlighting the, the development that we've made with CRISPR-Cas9. We're really uh, excited and uh, you know, we've been thrilled over the past year or so to develop the kind of data sets we've been able to do. This is a very, very different tool to that was previously available and it provides really novel opportunities and, and very, very high quality data. Um, so lots and lots of different screening paradigms are possible. It's really up to you know, your imagination to come up with the right way to conduct the screen and then this can be some really great outcomes. Most of the screening power is provided by enrichment-based screening, so be that either uh, proliferation linked or by using uh, flow cytometry to enrich screening uh, data sets. Or in the case of a RAID screening, to use high content based approaches to enrich for uh, phenotypes which are robust and detectable by the assay application that you're using. But there are some really exciting opportunities to improve negative selection screening by combining data sets from dual loss of function studies, ultra complexity libraries, in a similar way to pooled shRNA screening has had some success in recent years by having very, very large libraries, 25 plus hairpins. And also, we think by using simple genetic models like the haploid tool, tools, you can really enhance the quality of negative selection. And we've generated some very nice data sets using negative selection as a, as a readout using explicitly using a haploid-based system. Uh, so the future for the next year or two is really around uh, developing what we describe as sort of um, ultra-rich data sets using things like single-cell RNA sequencing, and there's some really nice proof of concept studies published earlier this year showing the power of that kind of technology. Uh, so we are looking forward to getting involved with that kind of approach too. But I think I can uh, finish up now and hand back over to Daniela. Thank you, Dr. Cross. The audience has submitted several questions, so let's get to them. Um, first up, is transfection sufficient to produce a Cas9 cell line or is lentiviral transduction required? To produce a cell line, uh, you should be able to do that transiently. So yes, you should be able to do that with transfection. Um, the Cas9, in the context of a knockout, will be expressed almost always for long enough to induce DNA edits, um, and then they will be tr dropped out as the, as the episode is lost from the cells. Lentivirus is really only needed for two reasons in the, in the pool context screening. One is to drive really, really high levels of homozygous knockout, so as high as you can possibly get it. And the second is because we need to integrate a cassette into the cell so that we can actually detect the effect that was made uh, or the genotype that was generated without having to directly target the individual loci which that edit was made. So that's the kind of trick that we use to enable us to do this kind of screen. Thank you, Dr. Cross. Uh, next question. In a CRISPR-I system, how long does Cas9 stay bound to its target site in the genome? That's a really good question. So. Um, I think, well, it, it will be it will cycle on and off just like any enzyme, and it will obviously be affected by 
um, the, the cell cycle and how the, the DNA will uh, have to be replicated. But the data that we have certainly indicates that it is a very highly active system and also active from very, very early on. So, for example, if you take the data I showed today, where we're seeing almost the maximum possible level of enrichment of these factors, which are scrolling at the top hit, that would indicate two things. One, that the effect happens very, very rapidly as soon as you introduce the system into the cells, which is different to CRISPR knockout systems. And two, that it maintained high levels of activation or inhibition relatively consistently throughout. So I think that indicates that it's probably a relatively tight binding system. It would obviously be uh, considerably expressed from its integrated lentivirus as well. So the protein will be present throughout the entire duration of the cell uh, lifetime unless it was specifically shut down. So that would be, um, yeah, that would be the, the, the answer to that one. Thank you. Uh, next, will transducing cell lines defective in either non-homologous end joining or homology directed repair mechanisms with CRISPR-I libraries generate more dependable hits during a screen? Yeah, I think that's a very interesting question. I think it's probably a bit too early to say at this point whether or not you are generating more dependable hits from CRISPR-I. I think the data that we have so far indicates that there are, there's a lot of complementarity. Um, the CRISPR knockout tool is is extremely robust in terms of generating loss of function uh, and high levels of homozygous uh, deletion at the sites that we're targeting. And that's evident based on the things that we're seeing in terms of the maximum dropout rates and maximum enrichment rates. But you're right, there are some nuances to the way uh, DNA repair mechanisms occur that can introduce certainly silent mutations and you know, mutations which don't house a frame shift, which would probably be expected to not cause uh, a functional change to the cells of that locus. Uh, on the other hand, CRISPR-I will also have its points at which it won't be able to activate. There will be some uh, promoter regions which are too complex for various epigenetic regions to be able to uh, activate or inhibit effectively. And so I think the data sets we're generating at the moment will help us to sort of uh, step through this, this complex system and recommend the best uh, application for the best, oh, sorry, best tool for the best application. But at the moment, we're really excited about doing both sets simultaneously because I think there's a lot of opportunities there to get very high quality data sets. Great, thank you. Um, are there any published studies using CRISPR-I or CRISPR-A that follow an effect other than proliferation or growth inhibition? Yes, yeah, there definitely are. So there's lots of different studies already published using various kinds of tools. Many of them use complex biomarker-based approaches or response to pathogens. Um, there are also the, the, the the brief citation I've made the ultra rich data sets using single cell sequencing is also uh, some wonderful publications from earlier this year where you can couple CRISPR screens to RNA sequencing and gain transcriptomic level data. So clearly not just looking at proliferation. Great. Uh, just a quick technical question. How did you calculate the false discovery rate in the uh, Ramafrenib experiment? Oh, well, that's, <laughs> that's, that's uh, too complicated to go into uh, in the context of a webinar, but maybe we can forward that email address question to me and I can go through it in a bit more detail. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, <laughs> do you think there is any room or benefit for the CRISPR tools discussed today to be combined with already existing transcript knockdown approaches such as RNAi or SHRNA? Yes, I definitely do. So uh, I think there is, we've developed a lot of RNAi data sets in-house and paralleled that with CRISPR knockout technologies to try and look at the overlap of hits emerging from both technologies. And others have also done similar things. I think broadly speaking, it's fair to say that most CRISPR applications in the pooled format are outperforming RNAi technologies in, in, their, in their usual format. But there are absolutely ways to both develop uh, pooled SHRNA screening data sets, which are competitive in terms of their quality with CRISPR technologies. As I mentioned, you can look at these ultra-complex libraries with many, many hairpins, and that can be a way to generate very high-quality data sets from SHRNA screening. And certainly array screening, there's a lot of opportunities which are uh, likely to overlap in terms of RNAi and CRISPR. We find that, as you might expect, there is overlap, but there's also genes which score as hits in only one technology or another. Over the overlap we see is maybe around 30%, and then the, the rest of it is, is the rest of the hits are split uh, independently between the two different technologies, sort of in a mutually exclusive fashion. And I think that certainly when it comes to the knockout versus uh, RNAi technologies, that's expected because of the difference in the terms of the biology of what you're doing to the cells. 
Um, I think in terms of CRISPR-I and, and shRNA screening, there may also be some nuances to do with the technology. There is um, the way the, the off-target effects are, are kind of effect, uh, factored into the, the, the data that also may affect the different data sets. And I think our, uh, our feeling at the moment is that the more you can do in terms of uh, multiple approaches simultaneously, the better the quality of your hit finding is likely to be. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned CRISPR-Seq. Can you give us a bit more detail on what sort of benefits that assay would offer? Well, CRISPR-Seq, which is a broad term for things like perturb-Seq or crop-Seq or other technology equivalents uh, that have been developed in, in various labs across the world in the last few months, is uh, what I was using as a catch-all term to describe coupling RNA sequencing, single-cell RNA sequencing, to a, uh, a CRISPR-based technology like CRISPR-I or CRISPR-Knockout tools. So the benefits of that are that for each individual uh, perturbation, so knockout or, or inhibition based on CRISPR-I, you are able to generate a full uh, transcriptomic profile of the cell from uh, which was affected. So you can ask the question, which of the, uh, what are the, you know, the whole exome level of uh, expression level data, how is that affected by the knockout that you've made? But you can do that on a relatively high throughput level and looking at sort of tens to hundreds of genes, maybe not hundreds and thousands, uh, but you can certainly look at a great number of genes in a very, very high level of uh, data resolution. So really exciting opportunities there. Great. Thank you, Dr. Cross. And now we have time for just one more question. I'd like to conclude with asking you a more um, broad question that was asked. Uh, going forward, in your opinion, what will be most important for fully exploiting the strengths and unique capabilities of CRISPR technology? What potential real-world applications are you most excited about? <laughs> That's a very broad question, uh, so thank you. It, there are lots of opportunities on the, on the very near horizon in terms of developing the transition of hits which come from these very huge unbiased pool genetic screens uh, into validated targets. So certainly in terms of drug discovery, there's been huge problems associated with targets which have gone through very many stages of clinical and uh, chemical development rather, uh, and then dropped out because of you know, the biology not being properly understood or being limited by the way the discovery process was designed. And that is all a question of precision at the early stages. And the, if there's, you know, one thing that we're learning about this CRISPR application, the kind of CRISPR applications that I described today, is that there is a huge leap forward in terms of precision and, and reliability of the hits that are generated from these kinds of screens. So that kind of CRISPR technology uh, application, I think, is very, very exciting because I think in in our next 10 to 15 years of, of scientific development, we're going to see huge jumps in, in terms of the speed at which uh, biological processes can be unraveled. And that is going to have inevitable knock-on consequences for therapeutic application and, and, and medicine and health and well-being all around. Great. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. If you have any further questions, please consider reaching out to our speaker directly. His email address is shown on the screen. As a reminder, the webinar will be archived on the Scientist website and you will receive an email notifying you when the on-demand webinar is available. I would like to thank everyone who took the time to join us today, and particularly those of you who shared your questions and comments. On behalf of the Scientist, I'd also like to thank our speaker, Dr. Cross, as well as our webinar sponsor, Horizon Discovery. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye. <laughs>